Hey there everyone, Hitesh here, back again with another video. And welcome to another video, and we are trying to learn about AWS CCP exam, Certified Cloud Practitioner. Now one thing about this exam, this exam is really breadth heavy, not the depth heavy. This means that this exam tries to make sure that you are aware of as many services which are possibly there in AWS. You don't need to go in in depth of each of these services. You just need to know barely, okay, this service exists for this particular purpose and uh, this is the overview where this service possibly could be used. Uh, later on the exams which AWS offers like the associate architect or developer, they actually go in precisely some of these services much more. So this video, actually is a exam preparation for CCP. That is why we'll be going a little bit breadth heavy and this video will be a little bit theoretical heavy. Now, before we move there, uh, there is a common target as well. So please help me to achieve that. Uh, in this video, we want to have 200 comments. Let's see if we can achieve that within 24 hours. Uh, this is my personal motivation. Some of you might be saying that, hey, why are you asking again and again about the common target? Uh, consider this as my fees. Rest of all the content is available for you for free in high quality, uh, condensed information. So give me my motivation. You take your knowledge. That's a fair deal, I guess. So let's go ahead and proceed further about what else is there to offer in the, in the jungle of AWS. Let me share the iPad screen. So this is what we have. Okay. So uh, what we'll be doing is we have studied about the instance store. Now let's go ahead and talk a little about the EFS. So EBS, we have already studied about the block storage. Now what we want to do next is study about the EFS. Now EFS is another storage type which is available in AWS, but there's a small problem with it. Not problem, but you can say feature of this one. So again, uh, consider this is the VPC that we have. This is another VPC. That means you have two different networks that are actually accessing. And this is our EFS where the things are actually going on. And uh, any EC2 machine can actually access this e EFS. And rather if the machine EC2 is actually in the another VPC, or maybe there is an on-prem client which also wants to access this EFS, Elastic File Storage System, uh, they can also do that, but the only problem is you need to be on Linux. Uh, no matter where you are, on what VPC, all of them needs to be on the Linux. This is the reason because the EFS uses such a something known as NFS, which actually works on network and is a protocol which is available only on the Linux. So yes, there is a solution of Windows as well known as uh, FSX. We'll talk about them in this video only, but later on. But right now, if you see EFS, that's a solution for Linux. Linux people can only mount this drive via the network and hence known as a file system protocol uh, that works on the network. So it's a Linux only whenever you see EFS, any exam or interview, uh, make sure you are aware that it's a Linux only. Uh, then let's go ahead and talk about the Amazon S3, which is a simple storage uh, service. This is an object storage. If you remember earlier, when we discussed about the things uh, somewhat here, uh, we were discussing about EBS, EFS, and S3. So EBS is a block storage. We have studied quite in depth about it. EFS is nothing much more than just a file system, uh, but only Linux mountable, and then we have a storage. We have a couple of others as well, but these are the major ones which categorize them. Okay, moving on. So if we go up here, uh, then the Amazon S3 simple storage service, one of the most popular and among the one of the first service which was introduced in AWS. This is an object storage. That means everything is an object in it. Uh, for you, it might be directory and inside the directory there is a file, but for the object storage, everything is an object. The directory is an object, the file in it is an object, PDF is an object, video is an object, and S3 actually offers you a lot of things that you can do to automate your work and all these things. I'll share one of the incident or a use case which we used uh, quite a lot. So in the earlier days and still, uh, we host a lot of our videos on the S3 bucket. So what we do is we upload our videos on the S3 bucket. You can do that via a web browser or directly you can drag and drop. And S3 has a mechanism known as simple notification service and SQS, a simple queue service. As soon as an object lands into that bucket, you can automatically trigger an EC2 machine to pick that new object, process it, maybe videos you want to convert into 480p, 720p, and 1080p, and then you can put them back into the same S3 bucket or another bucket. So it's a really powerful thing that you can do to automate the stuff. It's an object storage. It has an API access, so everything is API accessible. Uh, bucket is everything. So they look like just like a folder, but every folder is actually a bucket. That's what the S3 is all about. Consider this as a container. And inside the container, you can create more folders and can store PNGs, MP4, whatever you like. 
Uh, the access is usually URL based and remember all the access is blocked by default. Nobody can uh, have a public access of these uh, objects by default. You can make them publicly accessible. In fact, you can host an entire static website on it. Uh, but mostly it's, you have to do configuration for that, by the way. Uh, everything is URL based. This is how it looks like. So this is your S3 object, or you can say S3 bucket. And inside this bucket, uh, this bucket is accessible via the internet. That's why this www sign anybody based on the configuration, whether you have allowed the public access or maybe not based on this, anybody can actually uh, access the S3 object. Now what happens is some of these objects can be accessed by only some EC2 machines or something like that. Uh, what used to happen earlier, this is your VPC. This is your private uh, network inside the Amazon. In that there is an EC2 machine. That machine is protected. That machine is not exposed to the internet or the world. It's only accessible via inside the VPC. But if you want to access any S3 object, uh, you have to actually expose this machine uh, to an internet gateway, IGW. You'll see this quite a lot. And this used to be earlier the case in which you have to connect an EC2 machine with an internet gateway. That means anybody can now have an access of it. Yes, of course you can control ports and stuff, but some of the work is very sensitive. You don't want to expose it to the internet. And through the internet gateway, you actually go ahead and get an access to S3 object. Uh, this was quite a complaint for quite a while. And after that, AWS actually built a service known as uh, S3 Gateway. Uh, S3 Gateway Endpoint, this is the full name, but it is known as in the whole community as S3 Gateway. So S3 Gateway, what they do is you can now access the S3 object because ultimately S3 is also inside AWS. So why need to go to the internet this way? Why can't we just install a gateway and without even the internet access, I can access my S3 object. So that is the way. Uh, otherwise, without the S3 Gateway, uh, there is no way you can access the S3 information, regardless you are in the same VPC, same AWS account, but in order to access that, your machine needs to have either the internet gateway or the better option is actually to have S3 gateway. Uh, so again, uh, it's known as S3 gateway endpoint, but everybody calls this S3 gateway. I'm going to do the same. So in the S3 object, everything is universally unique name. So that means if I have made my bucket as test, you cannot make your bucket as test, even though you have a different account. Uh, it's a universal uh, unique name or universal namespace, you can say. So everybody needs to have their own unique bucket. And that's a very tricky situation. So that's why you'll see a lot of random numbers and names uh, in the bucket name. That's a very common practice. Uh, transfer acceleration, this is another service that is offered on top of S3 that is that actually uses Edge. And what actually allows this transfer acceleration, it improves your upload and download speed via the S3 bucket. There are some special use cases where uh, transfer acceleration is actually being asked in the exam. So make sure you pay attention on that. And uh, just right now, we discussed about the events that you have a simple notification service or simple queue service. I told you, in the world of AWS, everything is abbreviated aggressively. So we use it for processing the video. So just always remember this uh, example that we were able to process our video as soon as somebody drops the video in bucket, we were able to process it with EC2 machine and put it back into the EC2 machine again. So there's a lot of things that we can do. And there are also versioning and replication facilities available in AWS. Maybe you want to have a version on your buckets. Maybe you want to have a replication on that. So that is also done. Okay. Now, uh, S3 storage class, this is also quite uh, asked a couple of questions, not too many. And then we'll obviously see the console in the next video that how this looks like. It's a very, very short video, <laughs> no, nothing to be there. Uh, S3 buckets are actually offered in varieties. So that depends on how fast you want to access your data or how quickly you want to access that and what should be the pricing of that. So this is all the tiering that they offer. You don't need to memorize any of them. All you need to know is S3 standard. This is the default way of how you put everything in the S3 bucket. This is the S3 standard. Uh, this is general purpose storage and for frequently accessed data. So how quickly you want to access your data, that is where the pricing is there mostly for the S3 bucket. Of course, how much you are storing that also cost, but majorly the price that hits you is how fast you want to access. For example, the S3 intelligent tiering, it's a really nice one, they use AI and machine learning to understand that how frequently you are accessing some data. If some data is not being accessed too often, they actually move it automatically to some of the inexpensive 
uh, tiers or the classification of the storage. Uh, then there is S3 one zone express. That means you will only have a one zone available. Most of these S3 objects, they are actually backed up into three zones. So that gives a lot of redundancy. But this one only, uh, S3 express one zone, it, as the name says, it's only backed up or being placed in one zone only. Uh, then also we have um, S3 standard IA uh, in which you want to have infrequent access to the data. You can actually move it. Obviously this is cheaper, but you won't get immediate access as something like millisecond. Some of these milliseconds are like single digit milliseconds. Some of them are milliseconds, but they take some time. Uh, then also we have these uh, last two ones, which are uh, glacier instant retrieval and glacial flexible retrieval. Uh, whenever you hear the word glacier, uh, one thing that you should know is the retrieval time and the minimum duration. So uh, the retrieval uh, cycle is actually pretty big. You have to keep your data and you will be charged for 90 days. But the way how, if I want to access my data and it is in the flexible retrieval, it might take minutes and usually it takes hours because you are saying to Amazon that, hey, charge me less because I'll be accessing this data very less. If I'll need that data, I'll let you know in advance. I'll start the trigger and then you can have the access to this data and uh, it might take hours that before I hit it. So maybe there's a lot of previous backup. You probably don't need it apart from auditing or something in two years or five years. You can definitely put it there. And within hours, you'll get the access. So early morning, make an access request and by the afternoon, you'll have all your data. Uh, similar goes for the, this Glacier instant retrieval. Uh, Glacier used to be only hours of retrieval. Now they have uh, made another tier, which is instant retrieval. Obviously they charge quite a bit for it, uh, but this is what they are having. Uh, all of these is highly durable data and highly available data. So your data is not going anywhere. Uh, they give this 11, nine uh, durability that, hey, your data is not going anywhere. That's quite a lot of SLA service level agreement uh, that nothing is going anywhere. Availability is there, availability SLA, you say 99, 99. Only uh, one of them gets a little bit 99.9, uh, but rest, just assume that everything is always available. Okay. Uh, so this is the basics of how this is going to go. Uh, in the later on videos, we will learn about the console of uh, S3 as well, how this looks like, what all the features are there. Uh, can I drag and drop a file in this? Can I access the file? What's the features of it and how I can do it? Okay. Another type of file system which is available in AWS is known as FSX file sharing service. And there are four types of it. Just like we have EBS and file system for Linux and all of that, Amazon eventually realized that just having a Linux-based file system which is shared into multiple of these EC, AC2 is not gonna be cut throwing. Uh, a lot of people use Windows and we need to give more options to it. That's where they design another type of file system which is FSX and they have a four variant of it as of now. Uh, for the exam perspective, you have to remember that FSX for Luster is something that is used for high performance. Anytime you hear machine learning or fast access of data, high performance, sharing of the data, that's where you want to select the Luster. Only one of them is actually Windows based, which is known as FSX for Windows File Server. The name explicitly tells it that this is made for Windows. So this is Microsoft Windows Server, and this is how it looks like. Uh, there are so many file system available in the world. Uh, there is ext4, FAT, NTFS, Mac has its own uh, file system. Uh, so there's so much of them. A uh, couple of them is open uh, ZFS and there is uh, NetApp as well. Uh, they are also available if you are looking for a NAS application, backup storage, NAS devices where you plug in your hard drives and act take backup of your videos. Almost every YouTuber has this one. Uh, so for this one, we use FSX for NetApp. So they are also available. But for the exam perspective, all you need to know is uh, when you see the luster, this is high performance, machine learning and all these things where you need the data to be high performant. Uh, this is the file system, uh, uh, file system that you want to use. For Windows, no, NFS is not the correct answer. The correct answer is FSX. Uh, if you want to Windows file sharing, FSX and specifically the version that you want to choose in FSX is FSX for Windows file server. That's it. Okay. Uh, this is a small diagram. Uh, notice here, these are EC2 machines. Uh, exactly same diagram that we saw in the EFS. Uh, these are Windows machine, by the way. And also on the on-prem, we need to have a Windows. So all of them can access FSX. Exactly same diagram that we studied, exactly same. Another service that is asked uh, quite a couple of times in the exams as well is AWS Storage Gateway. Uh, this is a really nice and neat service, uh, which helps you to actually understand. So a lot of people, uh, 
I have seen they spend hard time in understanding what is this storage gateway. Let me walk you through. Uh, first of all, let's see what happens when you have, let's just say you have built an application which is on your own prem, internal tool for your company. And this on-prem relies on a data, a lot of data that everybody is writing code or doing something and putting the on the server, which is on-prem, on the premises of the company. Obviously, accessing that data would be really, really ridiculously fast compared to something on the cloud. It's almost like accessing your hard drive. So that is like, so on-prem applications requires fast access to data, fast access and code changes. So what happens is, let's just say tomorrow if I say, uh, you know what, we will not access the videos or the PDFs from our in-house in internal data, but we'll be accessing them from the cloud. Now you will be worried about code changes that you will be making like, okay, I have to make the code changes, whether we are getting it on, on the cloud on S3 or uh, some Azure or some whatever. So what AWS did is a really neat, tricky way. What they did is they designed something known as file gateway, or they call it a storage gateway. Uh, the whole name is storage gateway, and they have a couple of different variants, just like FSx have different gateways. The service name is storage gateway, but this service actually further offers that on your on-prem device, you can actually install something known as storage gateway. And then this is storage gateway, there are types of storage gateway, file gateway, FSx, volume, tape, these are just variations of that. Now, once you install this kind of an agent on your on-prem servers, they actually allows you to get everything access on the S3, but you will never realize it. Because what they do is, they actually allows your server to have an access of it directly. They do it via some cache mechanism or something. All you have to understand for this particular thing is this is a storage gateway access of how they do it. <clears throat> Little informal, but that's how we do it. <clears throat> so, this storage gateway is nice agent that you can install on your server. And however you were previously accessing your data via the file gateway system or file sharing system, maybe you were mounting some volume on your um, on your sharing network, whatever you are doing, you can keep on doing that. And this actually gives you access of S3 as well in the AWS. Pretty smart and clever uh, way of actually doing. So storage gateway gives access to the cloud storage with low latency. Uh, no protocol changes and unlimited storage. Of course, it's, S3, it's uh, Amazon S3, it's unlimited storage. So this is a nice way. So anytime you hear about the storage gateway, that means, okay, gateway is going to get installed as an agent on the servers, and now we can have a cloud interactivity without the latency of the cloud uh, or being worried about, I have to cha make changes in my in my code so much. You don't have to do that. That's That's the whole idea. Okay. Uh, there's one more service. Uh, yeah, there's one more service. There's a lot of service AWS offers. Uh, this is known as Elastic Disaster Recovery. Uh, yes, sometimes there are a couple of questions around this one as well. Not couple, just one usually. It's a free question. You can always pick it up and score quite well. So Elastic Disaster Recovery, Amazon wanted that there are a lot of customers which are not yet onboarded on the cloud. So what do we want to, how we can offer them a service? The whole idea is if you're putting everything on your on-prem services, at least let us manage your backup. So if what happens if your premises uh, is under fire or there's a data loss and you want to bring the backup of everything, how can you do that? You cannot do that. And we can actually offer you a service via Amazon disaster recovery. So if there is a disaster in your company premises or somewhat, uh, at least allow us the cloud provider to at least have your backup. That was the initial. So Amazon leaves no stone unturned to get at least some customer on their on board. That's how they do it. So what this does disaster recovery service allows is on-prem recovery. That's their whole point and point in time recovery. There are a couple of, uh, what point you want, how much, there, there's a lot of on it. The, what you have to remember is disaster recovery is to get the backup in the AWS cloud from the on-prem server. And the way how they do it, you just need to watch this diagram and you will remember it forever. Uh, on the on-prem services, uh, maybe you are having Windows, Linux, whatever you are having, uh, there is some service that you are running, we don't care about it. On each of your drive, how many drives you have, you have to install agents on it. And AWS offer agents for all the systems and everything for that. Uh, so these agents are actually installed on the on-prem services. These agents silently report to the EC2. Not silently like in a, in a malicious way, but silently means you can keep on doing the work, they'll keep on doing the work. So these agents actually report back to the replication server, which are hosted on AWS. Uh, by the way, quick uh, side note for the practical and the real world interviews as well. Uh, these replication service, when they host EC2 and all of them, they do cost money. So 
coming back. Uh, these agents report best back to the replication server and these EC2 machine constantly take data from these agents block by block from the OS and they keep on storing them on the EBS. So later on, if there is a recovery, since everything was stored in the block, you can actually create another exactly same OS machine, uh, whatever the virtualization you're using, VMware or maybe a real machine, whatever you're using, you can actually make an exact copy of that and just buy a new hardware, copy paste it, and that's it. Uh, by the way, there's a process you have to again have a servers, which again have EC2, which actually does the recovery job. That's for another day. Uh, but all you have to do, uh, remember right now, is there are agents which are installed on the on-prem. Uh, they gives you the point in time recovery. And this is one of the uh, great way how Amazon uh, probably in the year, I don't remember exactly the year, in which they onboarded so many of the corporate customers just for the backup, and eventually they started using the services. So this was one of the master plan that AWS actually offered. All right, so quite a lot of information, and that's what this uh, CCP exam is all about. A lot of stories, a lot of fun theory that we have, and you get briefly comfortable with AWS and all these things. So that's it for this video. I hope you have enjoyed this. If yes, then comments, please. And let's go ahead and catch up in the next video.